This week on a special Final Four edition of One Devotion, meet our Final Four newcomer who overcame more than almost anyone to reach Berlin. Find out why another first-time trophy hunter takes added inspiration from his late father. Learn about the tragedy that changed a Final Four record holder's life one decade ago. And marvel at a young shooter's resilience in the face of repeated physical setbacks. The smallest player going to the Final Four in Berlin also took one of the longest and most difficult journeys to get there. Fenerbahce Istanbul point guard Bobby Dixon was born at the bottom of a staircase when his mother, a drug addict, couldn't make it to the local hospital. And from that moment forward, his childhood in one of America's most dangerous neighborhoods only got harder. I'm from Chicago. Um, I grew up in uh, a pretty, a pretty bad situation. Came from a really poor family and uh, it, we had to overcome a lot, you know, I had a lot of losses, um, and to be here is, like, amazing to me. The drug dealing that was all but a family business when Dixon was young exposed him to even worse tragedy. When I was 10, you know, I saw one of my brothers get killed. He was 13. Um, drive by shooting and uh, you know and also you know my mom at the time she was she was incarcerated as well and you know we was living with our aunt so we was kind of like bouncing around from aunt to uncle and, you know it was just to grandma it just was a, a lot of different situations that we was in with no stability as one of the smaller kids in the neighborhood Dixon had to learn quickly to watch out for himself I didn't really have a have no time to um, be a kid. You know, I had to learn really fast or, uh, you know, it was consequences if you didn't. But you have to, you gotta develop thick skin. You gotta be tough. You can't show too much weakness. Show weaknesses, you get preyed upon in them, t in them type of situations. The other thing that Dixon learned from his environment was how to deal drugs himself, and soon he followed his mother, father and older brothers to jail. But that mistake would prove to be the turning point in Dixon's life. Once I found myself in jail at 17, you know, I was so uh, hurt and I was so, like, mad that I put myself in that situation, you know, that... Uh, once I was in there, I told myself that I would never, ever go back. And I, um, I always had a vision of playing basketball, but my circumstances was, you know, I just couldn't really focus on basketball at the time. So once I got out, I put everything behind me and I focused strictly on basketball and it landed me in some good places. Few coaches were ready to give an unproven player with his kind of past any opportunities, so Dixon had to work extremely hard to prove himself. My main motivation is was that I had nothing. I had nothing to lose. <laughs> so if I put everything I had into this, you know, it's, it's, it's only something to gain. Dixon devoted all his time to basketball and proved himself first at two little-known universities but they gave him enough of a base to let him start his pro career in France's second division. That just stuck in my head for some reason. Being a professional basketball player, I don't know why. I mean, you know, even though my circumstances didn't say that, but for some reason that always was in my head. Dixon played in Italy, Poland and France, including his EuroLeague debut with Asvel Basket before landing at Pinar Karsiaka for three successful years that led to his big break with Fenerbahce this season, during which Dixon has made more three-pointers than all but four players in the competition. I didn't have a lot of things given to me. My whole life, everything I have, I work extremely hard to get. You know, so I appreciate everything that I have. I try to take advantage of every opportunity I get. 
As he has done since leaving jail 15 years ago, Dixon keeps embracing those opportunities to make something solid of life on the other side of the world, far from his disadvantaged beginnings. European basketball, I mean, this is my dream. You know, I'm living my dream every day, being a professional basketball player, doing what I love, helping take care of my family. Um, so this is everything I ever wanted. Among the family members Dixon has been able to take care of is his mother, who has been off drugs for 15 years and lives in the house he bought her. Likewise, Dixon spends his time whenever he goes home with young kids in the same difficult circumstances that he knew so well while growing up. I'm in, in tune with a lot of kids that's kind of troubled and, you know, who grew up like similar that I did. I do it uh, free of charge, you know, I don't, I don't, because uh, I know most of them don't have a lot of money. So I just try to um, just show them that it's a different way of living than the way they, that they see, you know, it's, it's other possibilities out here that they can uh, get into and venture off in if they, if they really want to do it. Few players have ever taken a tougher route to the Final Four than Laboral Cucha Vittoria Gastais' Davis Bertans. The sharpshooting star suffered his first, but not last, serious physical setback when he was growing up in Latvia and was involved in a horrible accident. Uh, yeah, I lost the finger when I was about 13 years old. I was helping my uh, grandfather and dad and my brother uh, cutting wood because uh, we needed our, our grandfather needed it for the for the apartment heating and I got on the wrong end of the uh, on the wrong end of the saw and uh, you know it was it was luck and a bad luck because I only lost that finger and it, it didn't really matter. Although it was obviously a harrowing time for a young man who was already making his way in the basketball world, Bertans appears to have employed selective memory to remember the incident as far less frightening than it really was. I think I've deleted that out of my memory because we just talked with, them, with my parents a couple months, like in this, during the summer about that. and. Uh, and they said that I was struggling. I, I thought that I should quit and go play football or something, but, but I don't remember that. I didn't realize, I was too young to realize that at that point, but uh, my, my dad, he thought it's, it's over. Like, I have to think about something else, but I, I was playing basketball since I remember myself, and, and that didn't really change nothing. As, as the time passed, it, it took me a month and I was back on the court with, with other kids and, and playing, so. A few years later, Bertans was establishing himself as a highly promising young professional in the EuroLeague with Partizan Belgrade, when he was hit by a serious knee injury, which initially made him fear the very worst. I thought it's over. Like, when, when I looked at the knee, it was swollen twice as big. I thought that my career is over, but then it took my family, my friends, helped me a lot. And uh, after the surgery, I just I was thinking about just coming back. Definitely, the positive thinking was the key, because uh, all the physiotherapists that I worked with uh, coming out of the surgery, they said they never seen anybody come out of the surgery like the first day, almost happy. <laughs> but of course, I wasn't happy, but. Uh, the thing that does that I knew that every day is going to be better now that that helped a lot. He duly recovered and continued to impress after moving to his current club, Laboral Cucha. But Bertan's terrible run of bad luck continued as he was struck down by another serious injury to the same knee. But his positive attitude and past experience meant this time he wasn't too concerned. It was easier, mentally. Uh, as the moment it happened, I realized that that's, that's the same injury. But the swelling was not so big, and I understood it's not as bad as the first time, because the first time I, I tore more than just one ligament. It was more than that, and uh, I realized it's gonna take me another nine, 10 months. At least I knew what is what was coming. I knew what to expect, and, and that made it easier. And, I think I was the only person not so worried about it after the injury.
Bertans was eventually able to return to action midway through the current season, but with a wise head on his 23-year-old shoulders, he made sure that he did not try to come back before he was ready. And this time was a little bit easier because uh, the first time, once I got to like six nines, I felt I felt great. I felt physically ready, but then people were telling me, just slow down, you need to take your time. And I was like, why? I feel ready. But but now the second time after after going through that once, I was I was the person who was like, okay, I know I, I feel great, but I still need a few more months to just be 100% ready. And uh, that, that was the key. I have a long career in front of me, just the one month now is not going to change a lot. That proved to be the perfect approach, because when Bertans did appear on the court, it wasn't long before he was making big plays to help maintain his team's superb season, which has taken them all the way to the Final Four in Berlin. And after overcoming so many obstacles along the way, he's even more appreciative of the opportunity which is now in front of him. Of course, I'm proud of myself and uh, and come back after the second in injury. I knew that I can do that, but going to Final Four after that, that was that was something I didn't expect. And, and, and it feels great to to have a chance that like that and that I joined a team that was capable of doing that. They have reached the pinnacle of their sport by leading their teams to the Final Four, where each of them has lifted the trophy at least one time in the past. But well before they could become experts, the head coaches battling for this season's EuroLeague title in Berlin had to first fall in love with basketball. That happened a long time ago, when they were just kids, and basketball was one sport among many. But something told them that it was going to be their sport, for sure. And fall in love with basketball is exactly what they did. Thanks to my father, he take me very young to go to watch the games of club from my city, Borac. I remember that I wait every Saturday, like, really very happy to go and to watch the game. And I always please my, my father, you know, it was like one week talking about this. Can we go? Can we go to the game? I, I really like to go. So, you know, I will, I will always remember that. And uh, it was something special for me. When I was young, uh, I looked in the, the national Yugoslav team, uh, 80s and final of the 70s. And I, uh, they, they have great success in these moments. They, they were the champions of the world. The success of national team always, uh, always bring this uh, this kind of thing. So the young guys won't go to to play basketball, and I go to street and play basketball with my friends. The first touch with the sports was uh, like the majority of my age was soccer, but uh, a coach kind of pushed me to the to the basketball. So I, I really own him a lot that pushed me away of soccer and being in basketball. And then uh, over there, when I was 16, 17, uh, 87, the national team of uh, Greece have won the European champion, and that was a revolution uh, inside of me. Well, I remember uh, Boston Celtics with Larry Bird. Uh, Los Angeles Lakers with Magic Johnson and Karim Abdul-Jabbar. But at the same time in Greece, we had some great players like Nikos Gallis, Panagiotis Yanakis, Nikos, uh, Panagiotis Fasoulas. So those guys were my kind of idols. We have in that moment uh, just one TV game from the week, five o'clock Saturday, and always uh, I, I was ready for this game. Crucial moment for me, it was 73. I was 13 years old, and it was a European Championship in Barcelona that first time a national team of ex country, ex Yugoslavia, uh, playing Dragan Kicanovic, that he's from the same city like me, from Chacek. So for us, of, of this city, it was something incredible to see him, and this it was momentum that I really click and uh, I start to, to like very much basketball. Well, in Thessaloniki, it was a lot, a lot of basketball, uh, though. So, uh, and then I decided to go to Yugoslavia, and after that, Croatia, Zagreb, to study over there and uh, learn from the best. Being a player, 
It was a great uh, experience for me. I enjoyed it, but uh, at the same time, I had some big injuries uh, in my knees, so I had to finish my career a little bit earlier. So I thought that uh, a good step for me was uh, to become a coach, you know, just staying in, the, in this uh, sport that I love so much. Basketball is a great sport. It's very excited. It's 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 everything. It's I think it's the most beautiful and the most uh, excited sport uh, uh, regard team sports. I love basketball. I always is the same. You know, I'm very happy every day that I wake up and I come to dream and I have opportunity to to work with my players, to discuss with my staff, generally to talk about basketball. I hear basketball in my blood, really. The five-year EuroLeague career of Seska Moscow point guard Aaron Jackson has been marked by success every step of the way. Jackson has made the playoffs every season and will be in Berlin for his fourth consecutive Final Four as a record holder at the event after his seven steals in last season's semi-finals. His triumphs are even more remarkable when you know that 10 years ago Jackson barely escaped tragedy when he and four of his university teammates were victims of a shooting rampage at a campus party. On that scary night in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Jackson was fortunate that the bullets missed him, but the incident forms part of who he is today. The bullet uh, grazed my, my wrist and it uh, hit my other teammate, uh, hit him right in his bicep. Um, it was a very scary moment. Um, it's something that uh, I've been trying to forget for a while now, but you know, um, it was just a very scary moment that night and I'm um, real, real lucky to be alive. While Jackson never had to miss a game, his teammates were not as lucky. Three of them, including former All-Euroleague centre Sean James, saw their careers interrupted while they recovered from injuries. The fourth, talented forward Sam Asholu, never played again and almost lost his life. He got shot in the back of the head two times. Um, it was a very, very scary moment. I remember uh, him being on the floor. Um, still conscious to saying, I, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. Um, but it was like soft whispers, and then he just like passed out. Asholu made a miraculous recovery by learning to walk and speak all over again. He and Jackson, who were roommates, grew even closer after the incident and remain so today. Me and him were still friends to this day. Uh, we probably talked as much as we can. Um, he comes down and visits me in Florida. But more importantly, I just want to be there for him because I know uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't imagine the feeling of not being able to play basketball, let alone not ever being the same. So um, um, he's still the same person, a little bit slower, but he's still the funny guy, uh, intellectual guy. So uh, me and him still uh, meet up every summer. Jackson and Asholu eventually graduated together from Duquesne University, whose community came together in the shadow of the shooting tragedy. You know, it was just something that shook the whole campus, shook the whole university. The incident also brought the basketball team close enough to build relationships that all the players know will last throughout their lifetimes. We kind of bonded together like a family. and. Um, um, we had each other back since then, and um, we're, we're all still friends. We're all, we all still talk during social media, but it was a, a true bonding that uh, I don't think we'd never forget. Um, and, and we had, and we ended up having uh, two successful seasons, seasons after that. Today, Jackson is thankful to have enjoyed the opportunity of a strong pro career in the Euroleague. He is aware that 10 years ago, it could all have ended with a very different result. I'm very very lucky and I can't take anything for granted. Those two bullets could have been easily for me in the head and my career would be over, uh, my life could have been over. I don't take anything for granted. Um, I talk to the Lord as much as I can. I let him know that I don't take anything for granted and that, um, and that he's, he's helped me become a blessing for my family. And I'm 
after basketball, I'm going to try to do the best I can to pay him back. Few people ever go through what Jackson and his teammates did, but looking back, he always only tries to see the positives of the incident. It was just a, just a bad, tragic night that night. I don't know what I learned much from it. It's just more of a, uh, what I have gained from it. Um, I gained a, a great friendship between me and my, my teammates, and, and we still had that friendship. This may be his first Final Four, but Lokomotiv Kuban Krasnodar forward Viktor Klaver has played on big stages and won major accolades before, including the 2010 Euro Cup title with his hometown club Valencia Basket and three Euro Basket gold medals with the Spanish national team. But Claver is not the first such success in his family. His father, Paco Clever, was a European club handball champion as a head coach when Victor was just six years old. And even though he chose a different sport, Victor learned how to be a sportsman from his father, who passed away in 2011. He always tried to make me follow the right way in the, in the sports world because he knew he was a professional player before being coached. Among the lessons his father taught Claver was to keep his feet on the ground. He always tried to, like, not uh, listening to everybody that is talking about you because you're gonna have always people that's gonna support and people that is gonna, it's not gonna like what you do. And as much as you get popular, there's gonna be a lot of people in both sides. When Francisco was an active coach, the whole Claver family lived and breathed Hamble. And those are some of Victor's most vivid memories from his childhood. We used to go to all the games when, when he was coaching. Uh, I like I like Hamble a lot. Uh, I used to watch it a lot on TV with him too. But sometimes I remember when I was young, I was running around the, the arena, playing with some friends too. <laughs> With all that handball around him, it was a bit surprising that he ended up in basketball, although Claver himself admits it was not a premeditated choice. Actually, I started practicing handball, but in my school, handball was going down a little bit because it wasn't very popular. And there was a team, and they were uh, like three, four years older than me. And there was a basketball team with jungle players, and I had one friend from my class that was playing basketball. So it was a coincidence that I started playing basketball, and I like, I start getting better, and little by little, I like more and more. Before long, Claver had developed into a rising star with Valencia Basket, and a homegrown symbol of pride for the club, the fans, and the city. However, by the time he was 21 and Valencia was on its way to taking the Euro Cup title in 2010, Paco Claver was ill. Lifting the Euro Cup trophy with his father in the stands one year before he died remains seared in Victor Claver's memory. I was lucky that the Euro Cup we won with Valencia in 2010. It was in Spain, in Vitoria, so it was an easy trip to, to make uh, and that was very emotional moment because in that moment I was young, I was the captain of the team of my city and my family was there. I knew it was, it was going to be one of the last chances of him to, to watch me playing and uh, that, was, that was a great moment and uh, something that I will always remember. On the verge of playing for his own continental club title in Berlin, Claver carries the lessons he learned from his father, the first champion in the family, every time he steps on the basketball court. Of course, uh, I think of him every day and uh, I try to, to follow the example that, that he gave me, like trying to be humble uh, but always uh, give my best and never give up and that's the mentality that I try to to have on the core when I'm playing.
The last time Berlin hosted a Final Four, the 2009 Championship game featured dynasties led by two of the greatest EuroLeague coaches ever, then defending champ Seska Moscow under Ettore Messina and Panathinaikos Athens under Zelko Obradovic. A thrilling game that went down to the wire looked nothing like that as Panathinaikos dominated in the first 25 minutes. Vasilis Spanoulis and Nikola Pekovic scored 11 points each in a 13-2 first quarter run that helped Panathinaikos jump in front. Soon, back-to-back -back triples from Sarunas Yazikevicius and Dimitris Diamantidis opened a 10-point margin that was a sign of things to come. Athens would hit five more three-pointers before half-time, including a last one by Drew Nicholas that made it 48-28. When Yazikevicius extended the difference to 23 points to start the third quarter, the final looked all but decided. That, however, is when Seska surged, and Trajan Langdon's 11 points in a 0-17 run cut the difference to 56-50 early in the final quarter. Triples from Antonis Foxis and Stratos Perperoglu revived Panathinaikos, but Ramona Siskauskas, Viktor Kriapa and Matias Modis all stepped up as Seska positioned itself to tie or win on the game's final possession. When Siskauskas launched from behind the arc, it was the first time this century that a shot in the air on the season's final buzzer would decide the EuroLeague champion. But his well-defended attempt bounced out, and the Greens held on for victory. Jacica Vicious became the first player to win the EuroLeague title with three different teams, while Foxis and the Final Four MVP Spanoulis each finished with 13 points as Panathinaikos lifted its fifth EuroLeague crown on a memorable night in Berlin.